Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Uh, I was going through my box the other day and I came across a little holder for a die that I modified, bought it commercially, and it just didn't perform like I wanted it to, and I made some changes to it. And I'm going to take you out and I'm going to show it to you, but before I did, I figured, you know, before I teach you how to run a post pattern, I should teach you what a football is, right, Vince Lombardi? Here we go. Split dies. Got to be one of my least favorite things to do in the machining world is to run a die on a piece of metal. Can't stand it. Don't know why I don't like it, but I just can't stand it. If you're looking to restore an existing thread, they're great. But as far as running a precision thread with a die, I'm so comfortable running single point threads on a lathe that I would, that's not my first choice is to go for a die. I just don't do it. So. That being said, there are a couple of characteristics to a split die. They're not really sophisticated. They're a thread, you run it on, it cuts a thread, problem solved. Some are split like this. This is a standard button die, I think you call it. Some are split. Larger dies will have an adjustment screw coming through the one side so that when you screw the screw down, it spreads it out, makes the resulting thread bigger. Or if you unloosen it, <laughs> there's that word unloosen. If you loosen the screw and squeeze it tighter in the die holder, then you can constrict the die and you can make the thread smaller. On the smaller dies, the one that don't have a whole lot of wall here, you'll find a tapered thread in the corner. And as you drive the screw down towards the bottom, it spreads the die, makes it bigger or smaller, depending. Okay, simple. There's really not much to them. They have little buttons on the side. Buttons are for securing it in the holder, the handle, whatever. And there is, for the most part, for the majority of the dies that I've had an opportunity to deal with, a starting side and a trailing side. Now, a lot of you guys, a lot of new guys, will grab a die, pop it in a holder, run it down, thread looks absolutely horrible, and the die is all chipped to hell. So, gee, what I do wrong? Well, a die has the same characteristic as a plug tap and a bottom tap. One side is intended to start and the other side is intended to trail. But you can run your part through the die and I'll, I'll do a close up on one of the dies that I have and I'll show you what to look for. You can run the die through and when they take the die off, spin it around and finish the thread with the sharp side. But if you load the sharp side up, since the teeth are so sharp and there really is no delicate lead or chamfer on that die, the risk of cracking the teeth off on the back side is really increased, so do not use this as your first approach. Come in from the side intended. I've seen dies that are marked start this side. That's great that they do that for you, so you don't have to check it out if your eyes are getting old. At least you can see that start this side. But look for the chamfer, and I've also seen dies that have a chamfer on both sides, so it doesn't matter. And I've seen dies that don't have a chamfer at all. So it's up to the uh, manufacturer's preference, I guess, and when you're buying it, check it out. If you go to a hardware store and you buy a 96 tap and die set for 39 bucks, well, you're gonna get $39 worth of performance out of it. Don't be afraid to spend some money if you're gonna need to do it repeatedly. Important things about running this on, make sure it's the right size, make sure it's secure, and make sure it is perpendicular to your work. That's the other hard part. As you're running it on, you want that work running straight through, right angles. You don't want it this way. You don't want it wobbling around as you're doing it. I'll show you a couple of things to help you do that. Let's take a walk out to the lathe. Let's take a look at what I got. This die is a perfect example of what to look for when you're trying to figure out which side of the die to feed on first. You can see that these threads appear to come completely flush to this backside. All right. Naturally, you're going to see some chamfer. That's part of the thread geometry. But if you flip it over, I'll well, see if we can get it to reflect. There you go. See the big lead in there? Down inside. Much more of a taper to this die. This would be the side that you want to feed onto your work first. Now, it doesn't necessarily say anything about let's feed this side on first. And this is the type that does not have sufficient wall thickness. Uh, just bumped the camera. Sufficient wall thickness right here for a screw to come in from the side. So they put the little screw coming in from the uh, outside. Let's see if we can find one. Here's a, go. Here's a different one. This is the kind that they've decided to come in from the edge. Sometimes you can adjust these. Sometimes they pot them off with epoxy, but if you're in a pinch, dig it out, 
burn it out, do whatever you got to do, and adjust the die to make it fit. But most importantly, look for that big lead in your die and feed that side on first. If you need more thread and you just can't do it, after you've run the thread from this side, flip it around, run it from this side, and realize that the chance of cracking these teeth has greatly increased when you do that. So if you destroy your die, well, it's a risk you got to take. Okay, let's put this in a couple of different holders, show you a way to keep it perpendicular to your work, and away we go. Old Faithful. This is my tailstock die holder that I bought. I can't, I can't even remember how long ago I bought this thing. It's been forever. The intent behind this is to squeeze this in your drill chuck, put your die in it, and with the tailstock loose, you do not want the tailstock torqued down for this. Run the spindle in, crank it in, and as it engages, you'll feel the, you'll feel the lead in conjunction with how many rotations. And if you're off on your rotation, well then the whole tailstock slides. So it's a nice thing to use. But I also realize that if you're running a thread on something delicate, or something that has a little bit more need for torque, you may have to uh, engage a little bit more exterior pressure. Well, you're at the mercy of the machine, or are you? What I did to mine, I punched it out, reamed it, and I mount a drill blank in my chuck. This now sits on this now sits on the drill blank. So now it spins. Alright, well now that it spins, I used a couple of long shoulder bolts. Because I didn't feel like making handles, so shoulder bolts were the next best thing since I had a whole drawer full of them. Look at this. Now you have basically a die holder handle that you can take and you can drive on, twist it on as you see fit and when it gets to the end if the machine is running you can simply hold one of these and when you want the thread to stop let go and the entire assembly will freewheel with the part. This is a fantastic unit. I, I tell you, for the amount of times that I've used my die handle, I have used this thing a thousand times more than I've used my die handle, and that is not an exaggeration. Putting these handles on and allowing this thing to float brought a whole new level of comfort to it. And another thing you can do with this device, if you have a really long piece that you need to thread, first of all, make sure that the OD of the thread is not bigger than the rod that you've selected for the back. Mount this in your collet, let this spin, and feed your material with your drill chuck. Actually threaded about six feet worth of uh, M6 material one time for a metric job that I had to do, and it worked out fantastic. The only thing you need to do, watch out for, is the chips building up in here, so keep it flooded or keep an air blast on it. Neat little thing to have. Great little project if you need to make one. Nothing to it. All right. Let's put this stuff in the lathe and just give you a quickie visual on how it all sets up. Alright guys, let's explore a couple of options for keeping your tap handle or your die handle straight while you're running a thread on your part that's in the lathe. Option number one, and this is probably the most popular. First of all, make sure you have a chamfer on your part. Select the correct side of your die to go in. Make sure it registers. Take a big drill chuck, bigger than the back side of your die. Press it right up against the back of the handle. There you go. Everything is perfectly aligned. As you crank the handle, crank the, the tailstock as well. Let it float, but maintain a nice even pressure on it. That's option number one. Second option you have, use a live center. Get your part to register. Make a button or some type of pressure pad for the back of your die. There you go. As you crank, make sure you crank the tailstock in as well. Everything will stay perfectly lined up. Not perfectly, but closer than you're going to get by eye, that's for sure.
Now let's put the die holder in the drill chuck. We'll run it on, see what happens. Okay, now just for sake of catastrophic failure demonstration, I'm going to do this under power. I'm going to run it all the way to the corner and I'm going to allow it to hit the corner and continue to move. Let's see what happens. This is a Cetal and I'm going to run it on at uh, 130 RPM. I can expect this is going to strip out, it's going to be a horrible failure and you're going to ruin the part. My tailstock is not locked down, it's free floating and any movement of the die holder that you see is being controlled by the crank and the tailstock itself slipping along the ways. Make sure that it is not bumped up against your carriage. Make sure the carriage is out of the way. Here we go. You'll be able to feel the motion of the die. I'm going to run it right up against your shoulder. All right. Now it's sitting still and the part is still spinning, so I have to imagine that that thread is toast. Which is exactly what I wanted to show you. Let's pull it back off of here if it decides to come off, which it's not. That is well locked on there. Boy, you can smell it. You can smell the heat from where I'm at. So the die has effectively run up against the shoulder. The part continued to spin. The die had no place to go, and the teeth just simply undercut this blank. I'm going to have to put a pair of pliers on that, back it off. I'll show you what it looks like when I get it off. As expected, when the die ran up against the shoulder, the material continued to spin. The cutting teeth acted like a... Uh, radial cutting tool and absolutely destroyed the threads on the back side of this which is exactly what I was hoping to show you and we're going to show you the benefit of having this die floating in the next setup so there you go nice thread all the way through as soon as it hits the corner there's no place else for it to go the material yields and it destroys your part tailstock die holder is effective but you have to be very careful how far you go Let's take a look at it with it modified. This is the way that I use this die holder exclusively. That is a 406 diameter high speed steel drill blank. It's a 406 ream. This floats now. I will simply apply pressure to this as it pulls itself. It's about a one inch gap. It will traverse along this rod, pull itself onto the part. And when it meets the resistance of this corner, I'm just going to let it go. It's going to spin with the part. I'll throw the part into reverse, it'll push back off by itself, and we should have a perfect thread when this is over. Let me reposition the camera and take a look. And I'm going to do one more thing before we run that thread on there. I'm going to take a piece of cardboard and punch a 5 16 hole in it and slip it over top of this. In case this surface has any type of cosmetic requirement or it's a critical surface, when this engages the end of the part, it'll crunch up against the cardboard and not damage the part. If you need to finish it by hand, Give it another half a turn after you tear the cardboard out. Let's run it on. Floating setup is in place. I do have a small piece of cardboard that I've slid over the shaft and against the shoulder of the part. I'm going to engage the machine. I will hold this by hand until it runs up against the stop and then I will let it go and power back off. Let's see what happens. A lot of pressure on this, but as soon as it hits, it'll pull it out of my hand. There you go. No damage to the part. Break the chip in reverse. Off we go.
any existing material that you have that isn't threaded. You can see the lead of the thread is obviously, I would say, about half the die. It's surprising. And if you wanted to clean that up, we could turn the die around, run it back on exactly the same way. And away we go. That was dry. That was not done with any kind of lubricant or air. Let's turn the die around, see if we can finish off the thread. To finish the thread, I'm going to start it by hand, power it about halfway down, and then I'll finish the very last little bit by hand as well so I don't run the die up against the face of the part. I'll give you a close-up. Remember that the teeth are a lot more fragile in this direction, so take your time. You don't want to crack them off. I think that's about as close as I want to get. That's right up against. You could still keep a piece of paper or a brass shim or something on there if you're concerned about it. Let's power off. That's what it looks like. absence of an undercut I would think that's as close as you are going to get to the shoulder of this part using a die and at this point that's when you hit it with the steel wool or the file or emery whatever you want to clean it up with there you go make sure you start with the correct side of the die if you don't have one of these make one of these these are fantastic thing to have in your box and once you do you'll never go back to using a handle thanks for watching Alright, for all you bike lovers out there, this is how I got to work this morning. This is my everyday ride. It is an 1800cc Honda VTX twin. And I'll tell you, this thing will pull your arms off with the torque it has. Absolutely incredible. Shaft drive, computer control, fuel injection. This thing is a beast. got a, what they call a hypercharger on the side. It's a, like a ram air fuel system, or excuse me, a ram air intake. And then when this is on, this is flopping around like a top fuel dragster. It's pretty cool. All right, there you go. Boom, love it.